Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Koenig, and I serve as the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session entitled, How Can We Reduce Firearm Injuries and Deaths? as part of the Base Station Physicians Committee monthly evidence-based lecture series. Today, we will explore how we can contribute to reducing firearm injuries and deaths, a topic of exceptional importance in today's world, as it seems hardly a day goes by without news of some type of gun violence or school shooting. In fact, San Diego County EMS was placed on alert just this last Friday for a report of an active shooter in a local high school. While this report fortunately turned out to be unfounded, gun violence has certainly reached crisis levels and become a public health emergency in our country. Today, we will hear from two nationally recognized expert speakers with the goal to connect public health and medical initiatives with law enforcement strategies to address this critical issue. It is my great honor to introduce our guests. Our first speaker, Dr. Amy Barnhorst, is Professor of Psychiatry and Emergency Medicine at UC Davis, where she leads the Bullet Points Project, a firearm injury prevention curriculum for healthcare providers. Professor Barnhorst will be followed by the Honorable Summer Steffen, our County District Attorney, who will share her amazing work on the creation of protocols for the prevention of school shootings. Following the two presentations, we'll have time for a question and answer session. Dr. Barnhorst, over to you. Thank you so much. And um, thanks everyone for being here on this really important topic and for having me today. Um, I have a brief slideshow and uh, I'm gonna cover two things. One is the epidemiology of firearm violence in our country. And the other is a project that I'm the director of called the Bullet Points Project and how this is a project that's targeted at healthcare providers to play their part in this public health crisis. Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about how we can work together to reduce firearm injury and death. And um, you all heard who I am and what I do. I'm, I'm by trade an inpatient and emergency psychiatrist. I'm actually on the inpatient unit right now with a sign on my door saying, page someone else if there's an emergency. I'm giving a presentation. Um, and I got into this work because I do a lot of suicide and violence risk assessments. And I increasingly became aware of how important the, um, the contribution of firearms was to lethality and risk. If you're on Twitter, you can follow the Bullet Points Project, which you'll learn more about in a minute, and me on Twitter. Probably the Bullet Points Project is the more educational of those two. A little bit about the firearm injury problem in this country. So these are um, firearm suicide and homicide rates by various uh, developed countries from 2010. This data is old, but it really stands. You can see that um, while some of the other developed countries have moderate suicide rates, our suicide rate, and this is not um, raw numbers of people, this is per 100,000 people. Our suicide rate by firearm is about double what it is in other countries, and our homicide rate in the blue is much, much higher than anywhere else. Most evidence points to the cause of this as the number of guns that we have. So the US is a little less than 5% of the world's human population, but almost half of the population of firearms. There are guns in about a third of households here in the US, and that comes up to um, somewhere between you know, 400 and uh, 600 civilian owned guns. There was a big surge in firearm purchasing during 2020, during the COVID pandemic. There were, many of you probably saw in the news, there was a you know, rush on toilet paper and a rush on guns and gun shops had lines way out the door. Millions of people became first time firearm owners People who were established owners bought more guns, fueled by the civil unrest of that summer as well. And um, we saw an increase in violent crime and homicide rates that year, probably again, due to the increased number of firearms in circulation. The majority of people now, and this is a big shift from the 70s and 80s, when people owned firearms for sport shooting or for hunting, people now own guns um, overwhelmingly for self-protection. So that's the reason 70% of firearm owners give. 
For a long time, we had another public health problem in this country, and that was motor vehicle crashes. And you can see here that back in the 60s and 70s, the deaths by motor vehicle crashes were really significant. We threw our best experts at it from all fields. We took a public health approach, doctors, engineers, uh, people who design cities and roads, physicists, everyone. And we came up with some really good solutions based on how people drive, what they're driving, where they're driving, how fast they're driving. We've really been able to bring down the rate of fatalities from motor vehicle crashes. Less so with firearms. And in fact, a few years ago, we had the unique distinction of crossing over so that now firearms kill more people in this country than cars. In 2020, that was 45,000 people died from guns. And that means it's over 120 people every day. And each one of these people being somebody's son, daughter, mom, brother, sister, family member. We often think about firearm violence and firearm deaths when a big mass shooting is covered in the news. And those events are horrific and really you know, can shock everybody to their core because it seems like it could happen to any one of us in any place that we used to feel safe, like theaters, churches, schools. But really the deaths from those shootings represent less than 1% of firearm homicides and even less than that of all firearm deaths. Because the truth is, and this is rarely mentioned, is that the bulk of firearm deaths come from suicides, not homicides, and certainly not from mass shootings. This is 2020 data. Um, and again, oh, sorry, I think it's actually, my, my picture is covering my date here. Yeah, it's 2020 data, sorry. Um, 2020 was, a, again, a particularly violent year. Most years, the split is more like one third homicide, two thirds suicide. And these deaths are not evenly distributed. You can see here that um, if you are a young black male, so oops, went too far on my slides. If you are a young black male, your risk of dying by firearm homicide is almost 20 times that of your white peers. Um, black males, and I'm using males because they have much higher rates of firearm homicide death in females. Black is the red line and white is the blue line. So there's a very unique race and age distributed risk there. Same for firearm suicides, although the distribution is very different. There's a bump in suicide risk for all men. And again, men have much higher rates of firearm suicide, so I'm not using women in the graph. But everyone's risk bumps somewhat when they're a young adult. But white men keep the highest risk. And then in the older years of their life, their risk really skyrockets. This may have something to do with the demographics of who owns firearms. And just having a firearm in the home is a risk factor for firearm suicide and suicide in general. We think a lot about the deaths and the people who lose their lives from guns, but for every person who dies from a firearm injury, and many of you who work in EMS see this, another two are shot and survive. And this is not without its consequence and its burden. So almost 90,000 ED visits um, for non-fatal firearm injuries happen per year. And the distribution of the mechanism is different here. So you can see that whereas suicide was more than half of the firearm deaths, it's a really small slice of the pie. Only about 3% of non-fatal firearm injuries are from attempts to hurt oneself. That's because most suicide attempts with a gun, you don't survive. Nine in 10 are fatal. About 40% of non-fatal injuries are from assaults. And whereas unintentional injuries play a very small part in firearm fatalities, they're responsible for about half of firearm injuries. Even for those who never have a bullet pierce their skin, there are very significant socio-emotional consequences of firearm violence. This is an image that's adapted from the Violence Policy Center about all the ways in which exposure to violence and living in a neighborhood with high rates of violence can affect the, um, the community, especially the children who are developing there. So they, they have um, problems with their education, problems with their cognitive abilities. They have psychiatric and psychological well-being issues like PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, they suffer the brunt of high involvement with the criminal justice system and being victimized by violence or even witnessing violence is a risk factor for future violence. So this is one of those um, self-perpetuating cycles where kids who know there's violence in their school are more likely to bring guns to school. If there are more kids bringing guns to school, there's more violence and so on. It affects the economic investment in the neighborhood and the neighborhood cohesion. So people don't want to set up 
coffee shops and museums and art galleries and have nice parks and therefore kids don't go out and play and they don't ride their bikes to school with their friends. And then this has consequences on their health. They engage in high risk behaviors and they are more likely to have chronic medical illness as well as chronic psychiatric illness when they're older. So living in neighborhoods with high exposure to violence, even if you're not a victim of that violence can have really detrimental effects on your psychological and your physical health. Okay, so what, um, what is our role as healthcare providers and EMS providers? What can we do? Well, one of the things that um, happened a few years ago was the state of California decided to invest almost $4 million in the development of a curriculum to train healthcare providers about how to reduce the risk of firearm injury in their patients. So one small piece of that public health puzzle. And we, um, in our work here at the UC Firearm Center, found in survey work that not only do um, most public health practitioners understand that this is a public health problem, but the physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs and nurses, they feel that counseling their patients about it is within their clinical responsibilities. Patients also say when surveyed, even firearm owning patients, someone has their mute not on. Um, if you could just mute yourself, thank you. Patients say they generally find it appropriate even if those patients are gun owners. And they especially think it's appropriate if somebody in the household is say at risk of suicide or there's a small child in the household. But this information on how to do this and how to do it well and what tools are available to healthcare providers is grossly lacking from most medical education programs and people report that they want more information. Because one of the few things that's been shown, and this is particularly for cases of suicide, but as we'll see, suicide is related to domestic violence and mass shootings as well. Lethal means safety, which means putting time and distance between someone and their firearm is one of the few things for which there's good evidence that it saves lives by suicide. We have a lot of suicide intervention programs and not to say they don't work, but there's not good evidence for most of them. This is one separating people from their guns in a time of crisis that is really shown to work. Um, one of our projects we're working on right now is we're working with someone who's uh, getting his degree in public health, but is also an EMS trainer who's a paramedic. And he did a great survey where he asked other EMS uh, people around the state, and some of you may have been part of the survey, what their exposure to firearms was while they were on duty on calls. And almost 75% of them in the highest bar reported being physically assaulted by a patient. 70% said that an at-risk patient had access to guns on a call. Again, almost 70% said they'd cared for a suicidal patient who had access to a gun. More than half had located a gun on a patient and about half had had a domestic violence situation where there was a firearm present. Again, about half said there were firearms where, that were accessible to children on calls. 45% said they'd had to handle a firearm on a call and almost 20% said they'd had a firearm drawn or used against them in the line of duty. So exposure to firearm violence potential and patients at risk with guns in their house or on their person is definitely a big issue for EMS. And so we're working now on helping modify our current curriculum so that it can be um, helpful and delivered to EMS providers as well, because their, their exposure in the field is a little bit different and the tools available to them are a little bit different. So this is just a picture of our Bullet Points Project website, one of the things we developed with our um, grant funding, and it's a go-to resource for people who want to know more about the situations in which the access to a firearm could really increase the risk of lethality, and then what they can do if they're encountering those kinds of situations. Um, the learning objectives for Bullet Points are to identify risk for firearm-related harm and ways to engage with their patients about that. And this includes having culturally appropriate and respectful conversations about it. So we don't take a, you know, anti-gun or pro-gun stance. We take a stance that, you know, guns are tools, lots of people have them, and they need to be, you know, treated as something that is potentially dangerous in the wrong situation. And so how can we work with people who have them in the homes to reduce risk? And, you know, again, one of the things that providers say is, well, you know, if I found somebody at risk and they have a gun at home, like there's nothing I can do. And this is a misconception, there are steps you can take. And so we want people to learn what the available interventions are if they find someone who's at risk. Um, I always like to state this because there's been a lot of rumor to the contrary, but there are no state or federal laws that prohibit clinicians, doctors, nurses, anyone from talking to their patients about access to firearms. 
So we at Bullet Points, we have an approach called the three A's. And this is, um, this is kind of a quick mnemonic to help remember what are the things you should think about when seeing somebody. And this you know, could be an EMS client in the field. It could be somebody in the ER. It could be a you know, family practice patient you've been following for years along with the rest of their family. And um, to help you kind of walk through the steps. So the first step is about our approach. And it involves being informed. So understanding about guns, the people who own them, why they own them, various ways of storing them and be respectful and take a harm reduction approach. So, you know, keep your personal politics out of it, be respectful of the patient's wishes and reasons for owning guns. And then understand that, you know, while the safest thing for the family, maybe to get all the guns out of the house, that's not going to be safe at all if they won't do any of it. You know, if you just lose your rapport with the patient, you haven't made any progress. And so making small progress or um, some steps that are harm reduction focused rather than, you know, complete absolute, like complete absolute steps, that's going to have a bigger effect. And then also think about the individualized approach of who are you, you know, who's at risk? Maybe you went out on a call or you're seeing a patient who's, you know, the mom in the family, but oh, it turns out they have someone else, you know, living with them who has dementia and gets really paranoid, or they have a depressed teenager or a curious toddler. And you want to tailor that for every individual in the home. We also don't necessarily um, think that it's, you know, that everyone has time or that it's necessary or that it's good for patient rapport to have a rote screening question about firearms for every clinical encounter. So we suggest that people assess whether or not the patient has the risk factors for firearm injury or death and really only pursue this avenue of questioning if they do. And um, you know that includes various demographic risk factors. If people have ideation, like suicidal ideation, or they're actually making active threats, then you want to assess whether or not they actually have access to guns. And if they do, are they willing to collaborate on reducing that risk? And then the third A is um, what are the actions that you can take? So these are those tools where people say, well, there's nothing we can do, but there is. So we'll walk through a little bit of this real quick. Here's an example of a pediatrician, you know, taking a harm reduction, respectful, informed approach saying, I ask everybody about things that pose a risk to their family. So he's putting it in that context of risk, water heaters, pools, medications, firearms, very much normalizing ownership. You know, what steps do you take to reduce access to firearms, for example, for your daughter here? Um, in terms of risk factors for firearm related harm, there are certain demographic groups like we talked about earlier that are high risk. But again, you're not gonna take action on every older white man who owns a gun just because of his demographics, but it's helpful to bear those things in mind that certain groups are at higher risk, like younger kids are at higher risk of unintentional injury. Individual risk factors, these are situations where, you know, if the person has this, this is when you wanna think about assessing their access to a gun, because if there is a gun in this kind of situation, it can really increase the lethality. So somebody who's had a history of suicide attempts or suicidal ideation, um, someone who has a history of perpetrating violence or even being victimized by violence, or if there's violence going on in their life now. People who misuse substances, particularly alcohol and methamphetamine. Alcohol is related to both violence and suicide. Methamphetamine and other stimulants, but um, we mostly see methamphetamine here is more associated with violence. Mental illness is not a real strong risk factor for violence, despite the, the correlation that the media often gives us between mass shootings and presumed mental illness, but it is a risk factor for suicide. And people who have very serious unmedicated mental illness can be at higher risk of violence. People with dementia or cognitive impairment um, in the early stages may have suicidal ideation and there's a slight bump in the risk of suicide then, but as the disease progresses, they may become paranoid they may misinterpret stimuli. They may you know, think people are out to get them and that puts them at higher risk of violence. And that anybody who's in an abusive relationship or has um, intimate partner or domestic violence going on in their home, a firearm injected into that situation can increase the risk, particularly women will die by a factor of five to seven. And all children in the home should be considered you know, a risk of lots of things, but um, kids are curious and surveyed research shows that a number of the, the majority of parents think that their kids don't know where the gun is and haven't handled it. But when the researchers interview the kids, um, about half of them say like, oh no, I've, I know where the gun is or, and I've taken it out and played with it. So it's kind of horrifying what um, parents believe their kids can't do and can't find, but kids actually can. And then again, anybody who's saying things like they're gonna do something or is having thoughts about it, that person should be treated 
as a risk, their access to guns should be assessed and their ability to collaborate should be assessed. So now we'll walk through some of the tools. Um, so if you do find a patient who, you know, has dementia and is becoming paranoid and has a bunch of guns at home, or you have a curious toddler and a handgun in the nightstand drawer, what, what can you say to folks if you're out in the field in their home, or if you're seeing them in the ED or in another setting? So this actually walks through, um, the blue is at the bottom, kind of the, the appropriate action for lower risk situations, and then the higher risk situations up in the red. So the safe storage is always, always a good answer. Um, this can be the right thing for families with curious kids in the home. Um, it can also be a good way for lethal means safety. If there's, for example, a depressed teenager in the home and the parents own firearms and are really willing to store them carefully, or if you can keep the firearm stored away from the person at risk. So you wanna make sure that they know that the firearm should be stored unloaded, locked up using a locking device like a trigger lock or a cable lock or in a safe or lock box. The ammunition should be stored separately. And this is really important. You'd be surprised at how many people forget this. You can't have your teenager know ammunition to the lock box or it won't really work. So um, again, this is one of those things that may not be a tenable solution for folks who own firearms for protection and they wanna keep a loaded handgun really close to their bed, for example, at night. And that's where some harm reduction approach, rather than saying like, well, let's get all the firearms out of the house and store them unloaded in the storage shed. Maybe it's better to say, all right, well, let's store them loaded in the lockbox in the nightstand, but it has biometric technology so you can access it really quickly and your teenager won't be able to get it. Another option, if you really wanna get the guns out of the home um, and the person is willing to collaborate is something called temporary transfer. And there is a um, background check exemption in California where people can have a firearm transfer to a family member or a friend without a background check, which otherwise we're pretty strict about in the state in order to have that person kind of babysit their guns until their suicidal crisis has passed. This is a time limited, you know, so you wanna make sure that you know you're not giving people bad advice to do something illegal. I think it's 60 days that they can do it. But there are also often gun ranges or gun shops or even law enforcement agencies who are willing to voluntarily store people's firearms for them. I know there's a range in Poway um, that has a no questions asked temporary voluntary storage program where people can just walk in and hand over their guns and come back and get them when they're ready. So here's an example of um, me having that discussion with a patient. Lots of patients I see have guns at home. And sometimes when someone's going through a hard time, they store them away. This is just temporary until they're feeling better. Is this something you'd be willing to consider? And you can see here that like the conversation I'm trying to normalize, lots of patients have guns. This is not you know, some horrible thing that you've done. And really reinforcing that this is a temporary thing while he's having a hard time. Is it something he'd be willing to consider? We're gonna work collaboratively here rather than saying like, we're gonna confiscate your firearms. Sometimes collaboration is not possible or the situation is so high risk, we have to consider emergency interventions. And if the person needs a mental health hold um, or they need mental health treatment, like if there's a psychiatric underpinning to the risk, then a mental health hold can be a really effective option. But if the person's not willing to relinquish their firearms, you may want to consider an extreme risk protection order. And this is a temporary but involuntary removal of somebody's guns and their ability to buy more. In San Diego, I mean, California, we call these uh, gun violence restraining orders. It's really important to note that these two are not mutually exclusive. There's a sort of preconceived notion out there that if somebody is put on a 5150, they can't buy guns anymore and they can't own guns that they already have. But the truth of the matter is there is a small bit of language on the 5150 form that says the person has a firearm on their person or in their possession. It can be confiscated at the time the hold is served if the hold is you know, given by a law enforcement officer. If that person gets put on hold in the ED or elsewhere or they don't have their gun on them, it does nothing about a firearm they already own. And it's gonna be a while before that person reaches the milestone in the system to prohibit them from ownership. Particularly, and I don't know if it's like this in San Diego, I'm guessing it is, but up here, a person may sit in the ED for days, you know, if not a week before they go to an inpatient psychiatric bed. And it's not until the point that they get admitted to a psychiatric hospital that they actually incur a prohibition. So if they get better and get treated and leave the ED, no matter how suicidal they were, and this happened to someone I saw the other day, and her gun's still at home on her coffee table, she's going home to that gun. She still has a right to own it. She's not a prohibited person. 
just because they didn't happen to have a bed that week. And so she never met that threshold for prohibition. That's why something like a gun violence restraining order in concert with a, with a mental health hold can be a really powerful way to make sure that person is not going back home to the weapon on their coffee table. Um, so just a little bit about 5150 holds, you know, these are really for folks who have mental illness that needs to be treated involuntarily. It's not a mechanism for violence prevention if it's not violence due to a mental illness, and it's not a mechanism for firearm removal. Um, but it doesn't, and it doesn't guarantee they won't have access. Gun violence restraining orders are a piece of legislation that we passed in 2014. These are, have become very popular, 19 states now have them, and they, um, they really were crafted in order to uh, avert mass shootings, because what they do is they give law enforcement a legal recourse to remove somebody's firearms, even if they have no felony convictions, no other prohibitions. They legally own their guns, but if a judge finds that they are a serious and imminent risk of violence or violence towards their self, uh, law enforcement can get an order or family members and they can have their firearms removed. These orders are modeled really closely after the domestic violence restraining orders where there's an ex parte order and an emergency order that guns can be removed from the situation and then the day in court happens. They do not require any criminal activity. So this is really important. You know, you, you don't have to make criminal threats. You don't have to have hurt someone. You can be posting stuff on Instagram that's scary enough. And if your classmates turn you in and there's enough evidence and somebody's willing to petition for the order and the judge finds there's cause, somebody can go to your house and have your firearms removed and place a temporary block on you purchasing more. And um, I helped craft and testify for this bill in California. And ironically, as a psychiatrist, one of the things I really pushed for was that there was no mental health component to this. Not because I don't think mental health and mental illness are important things, but it, it doesn't matter in the hot moment where you know somebody's wielding a gun around and making threats of you know shooting up their school, hurting their neighbor, killing themselves, whatever it is. We don't need to ask why. We just need to make sure we take away that how. Um, so here, there's two types. There's the emergency that law enforcement can get by phone in a really serious situation, or there's the ex parte order where family or law enforcement can get an ex parte order. And then within a few weeks, the respondent has the opportunity to come forth for hearing and the judge can continue um, that order at the hearing or they can remove it and return the person's firearms. It doesn't incur a lifelong prohibition, it's a civil order. Um, and you know it's been used a number of times to prevent, we think, we're not sure the shootings would have happened, but to intervene with people who appeared to be very close to perpetrating mass shootings, like in the waiting period for um, buying multiple firearms, had been you know, posting all kinds of things, writing manifestos. Interestingly, these orders seem to get used more frequently for suicide prevention, probably because suicide is more common than mass shootings. And one colleague did a study, um, I won't get into the very fancy math, but they basically calculated pretty reasonably that for every 10 to 20 of these orders, and they're called risk warrants in the state where they looked at them. For every 10 to 20 orders issued, they saved one life by suicide. So that's a pretty big result um, for people losing their firearms for a brief period of time with no you know, further mar on their record once the order is removed. Um, so for more information about this project and some of the curriculum and anything else about the epidemiology or ways clinicians can intervene with firearm um, violence prevention, you can check out our website, bulletpointsproject.org. You can get on our mailing list. We have a webinar series, a blog series. Um, we get to send out a newsletter. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, this is how our website is when you look through it. There's, it's organized by these clinical scenarios um, in which firearms pose a big risk. And then there's interventions for each scenario. There's some things about epidemiology and about guns themselves and gun storage under the basics. And then in the more resources section, we have a lot of resources, particularly for clinician educators who are teaching other people. So we have some slide sets, we have some um, videos you can use in your teaching if you're an educator. And we just launched our online continuing education course, and it is um, accredited for both medical and mental health care providers. You can get one uh, PRA, what do they call it, category one credit. It's hosted by the California Medical Association for Medical Credits and um, the American Psychological Association as well. And you can find a link to this on our website. And I'm gonna 
I think I'm not doing questions now because I will let um, DA Stefan talk first and then I'll we'll do questions at the end, I think. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnhorst. That was outstanding. And yes, I am going to invite DA Stefan to speak next and then we'll have our question and answer. Uh, our offices, our EMS office and the district attorney have enjoyed close collaborations on several emerging public health crises. For example, uh, strangulation initiatives and opioid overdose deaths. And we would like to contribute to prevention and reducing harm from school shootings as well. So now I will turn it over to the Honorable District Attorney for her input. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. Um, is the sound coming through well and everything? You are perfect. Excellent. And um, thank you, Dr. Barnhorst. That was an incredible presentation and um, really focuses attention that obviously uh, violence and violence um, resulting from guns, whether to self-harm or others, is much wider universe than school um, violence, school threats, which is where I'm going to focus. But um, school threats and violence do uh, affect not just the actual safety of our kids and our schools, but they also leave a perception or a feeling that schools are unsafe, which affects our kids, affects parents, educators, and is of high importance. Let me kind of uh, take you through a little bit the and focusing on San Diego instead of the national um, audience. And I'm just very excited to have 100 professionals um, join us for this. And hopefully you will uh, learn about San Diego's approach, which is unique and one that um, they're trying to emulate across the nation. Um, San Diego has become home because of collaboration with EMS and collaboration that's at the spirit of San Diego County um, has allowed us to produce protocols that um, are now being copied statewide, like Dr. Koenig mentioned, the strangulation protocol, which by the way, has reduced overall in comparison to when we started the strangulation protocol before and after measuring five years of fatality review has reduced domestic violence murders by 15% and reduced strangulation uh, domestic violence related homicides from 13% of the homicides to 2.3%. So evidence-based practices that rely on, on research and that include partnerships makes a difference. And the um, targeted school violence protocol that we have that I'm gonna discuss with you, uh, we are certain has also saved lives. Although it's much harder to me measure than a strangulation protocol with uh, fatality being the ultimate result, but it's just as important because we know the stories of um, cases that would have, if gone unchecked, resulted in violence towards schools that was interrupted. In San Diego County, in terms of targeted school violence history, the first big case that's known is in 1979, the Cleveland Elementary School. And then in 2001, which is probably more in everybody's memory, came Santana High School and Granite Hills High School. Um, and those remain tragedies that uh, people remember and um, are impacting us today. But um, in 2010, uh, there came a case that was pretty much miraculous and that a gun was used. It was used at close range by the shooter, but yet the two victims that were shot at close range, both of them survived. It is um, really anti any science that you follow and from Dr. Barnhorst, you know, that usually when you use a gun, there's gonna be a fatality. But in this 2010 case at Kelly Elementary School in Carlsbad, 
the two uh, girls uh, ages five and six were shot at close range, but uh, in both instances, it's clear the shooter was aiming at the heart uh, center mass, but where um, the bullet entered was in the inner part of the arm and went through and through, um, and both victims survived. I happened to be at the time uh, the chief of the North County branch of the DA's office, which is one of our largest branches. It uh, serves a million of our 3 million San Diego uh, population. And uh, on that Friday in 2010, when the shooting happened, I responded um, as the chief and um, deep dived in the case and working with a community that was shaken. This was an elementary school in a safe neighborhood. And again, this is lesson number one, that there, there isn't really a distinction um, for school shootings, but any school is, um, could be a target. There isn't really a rhyme or reason to what school is a target. And I, um, I took on handling the case and I tried that case to a jury um, in court and the defense was a mental defense, as you can imagine, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, which means you have two trials, one to deal with the guilt phase, whether the person is guilty of an attempt, multiple attempt murders, uh, seven in the case that I handled. And then another jury trial as to the same jury to determine whether the person was insane. There were many, many challenges, not to mention the least of which is that children ages five and six were testifying as witnesses in court. There were um, some of the moments that I'll never forget the, the, the sheer bravery and uh, just how accurate these kids were as they described what happened. At the end, um, the jury delivered what I believe is a just verdict. He was convicted and found to be sane. This doesn't mean he didn't have mental health issues or that um, the act of trying to kill young kids at, uh, mapped out to the time uh, that the kids would be at maximum capacity on the playground is not crazy, but it was not insane. It was goal directed. And he was put away um, in prison after a two year trial that ended in 2012. But that case um, just stayed with me. And it, it, it stayed with me with the understanding that um, this could happen again and that we did not really have any protocols by which we can prevent another school shooting. We can never guarantee that it won't happen, but we didn't have a system that operated in, a, in, a, in an evidence-based way when uh, a threat to a school happened. And of course, like all our, pretty much all the shooters nationally and locally, the uh, defendant in this case, the shooter had transmitted clearly his intent to shoot at, at kids. But our system, those warning signs were missed. And um, he scoped out schools. He did, you know, he told people that he was going to shoot at schools. But again, no one really reported what they saw and heard and assumed it was just babbling and that it um, was not real until it became real. We found out all of this, of course, by doing. Um, a regional forensic crime lab analysis of all his devices. And we learned how often he told everybody what he's gonna do, including his brother, who um, did not report to anybody or act. This tragedy that happened in San Diego became the genesis and a, and a sort of, um, I don't know, obsession, I guess, for lack of a better word, to create uh, protocols that could reduce the targeted violence in San Diego County um, from um, threats uh, of school shootings. So 
we worked behind the scenes with our partners, the schools, law enforcement, psychiatrists, and we met and we, we uh, invited expertise and we began uh, on our path to an informal protocol when it came to, came to those school threats. And then in 2018, uh, when uh, I had the honor of serving as district attorney, the protocols came live. They were signed by all 42 school districts. No, sh no um, small measure. Uh, so appreciate our schools coming on board, each one of them, creating a clear protocol for threats to schools um, so that no one is just guessing whether this is a joke, whether this is real, whether this is going to happen tomorrow, a year from now, or whether it's never going to happen. There was a clear protocol that gave teachers, counselors, schools a method of operating as to each school threat. It gave law enforcement and prosecutors a way of uh, responding in a measured way. Um, and it gave also school resource officers, it gave psychiatrists, psychologists, a path forward. And this became the, the first, uh, we don't know of another protocol like this at this expansive scope of all 42 school districts that um, operates in San Diego County. This protocol of 42 school districts was updated just as recently as the end of 2021. And we were very excited because always looking for the latest information, we brought new information to rewrite uh, our protocols, which I'm happy to report were for the most part remained uh, accurate and uh, remained relevant but we, we rewrote certain parts with the help of the US Secret Service, their National Threat uh, Assessment Center that um, had done a more recent study taking, um, taking studies from school shootings that were averted and learning from them what works, what um, are the methodologies, what are the things to look at to avert a school shooting. We updated this protocol in 2021. And again, all of the school districts, 42 school districts signed on um, to follow this protocol. Uh, law enforcement all committed to follow this protocol and our community stakeholders at large that are in, engaged and involved follow this protocol. So it is current and um, and relevant for today using the latest research. Now, with this protocol from 2018 going into the present, each a threat is, is followed in a certain manner and it is, it is logged um, so that it, the problem isn't um, just shoved under the rug essentially by moving a child from school to school, which we know in several national shootings that the uh, shooter was moved uh, from school to school or moved recently, but their track record of making threats, mental health issues, other issues did not follow that person. So it was almost like a surprise to the next location what was going on, what the past, and how can you do a threat assessment, which is at the heart of prevention? How can you do a threat assessment if that person is just moved from place to place? It's, it's not really, it's not possible to do a proper threat assessment that way. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about a threat assessment? So since the protocol, we have a threat assessment team that includes law enforcement. It includes mental health professionals uh, trained on threat assessment. Um, it includes uh, the schools and it includes um, people that have the expertise in threat assessment 
that look at cases that can't be filed where there isn't an attempt shooting, there isn't a, an actual viable attempt to do harm, but each one that hasn't happened yet, that is just words or words combined with some preparation is looked at with a microscope using this threat assessment team. And on the call with us is the person from the DA's office that is leading that effort and has been leading that effort for me since 2018. And that's Andrea Lopez, a deputy district attorney that has become the trusted person in the county for these threats and, um, and helps guide this threat assessment team. The team relies on certain things that um, that we know from all of the cases involving school shootings are, are facts that are present. One of them is that 80% uh, of shooters, 80% have told one person at least of their intent and that person ignored it. That close to 60% have told more than one person about their plan. And this medical field that's with us is really critical because you hear things. You might hear from a parent. You, you could hear an off-handed remark about, um, about the intent to do violence. And uh, with that comes your responsibilities under Tarasov to do a warning, but you're also protected you know, we overread HIPAA and FERPA to mean that there's no protections for hearing and knowing things that might lead to violence. But all of the law shows that when a, a, a health provider is trying to avert future violence, there are many protections for that. We know that 93% of uh, shooters plan their event. So this isn't something that just happens. It may take just a few days to plan it, but often we see that it takes months and even years that the planning is going on, leaving all sorts of telltale signs. No longer are we searching for a diary that tells about the plan, we are searching for the social media diary that where people are telling us their thoughts, their plans. Because for most of the school shooters, they are looking for people to discover the grandiose ideas of doing this violence. Sometimes maybe they're looking for help. They're looking for someone to stop them, but sometimes they're, they're looking for attention, for reparations for the harm that they believe they've experienced. In addition to the 93% that we know plan, the 80% that tell one person, the almost 60% that tell more than one person, we know that there are common features there is a grievance often. There is a grievance against either an intimate partner. That's why we see teen domestic violence, teen rejection at sometimes at the heart of school shootings. We see bullying as being central as whether it's bullying and in 50% of the cases, it is persistent bullying that keeps happening, bringing a responsibility on the part of schools to stop that bullying, to, to create an environment where kids feel um, cared for and heard. There is an individual at the heart of it that's experiencing sometimes multiple stressors, whether it is a divorce, a separation, a change in circumstance, a loss of the only person that that uh, they believe cared about them, uh, loss of a parental or other figure. The, the grievance issue keeps going on. And then in about 50%, there's a fascination with violence. And you see that fascination through 
um, Googling different um, violent incidents, uh, following closely the Columbine shooters that, believe it or not, have a group online that mimics and follows and reveres their actions. In, in one case where there was an averted shooting, the same markings were placed on the weapon as um, the, the markings that were placed by the Columbine shooters, that fascination. The month of April remains one of the biggest months for shootings because that was the Columbine uh, shooting. There are concerning communications and those are the things um, that we have to, we have to never, never ignore and what this protocol never ignores. As an example, in the last few months, we had about 46 incidents reported to our, through our threat assessment protocol to this threat assessment team that reviews them. Only 10 resulted in charges, charges for making criminal threats, which I wanna emphasize because I know health providers are caring, compassionate people and we experienced this with teachers where they didn't wanna report something for fear that it would ruin the child's life. One teacher didn't wanna report very concerning threats to herself left on a note, really concerning, but wanted to let it go until this problem grew and grew into a more imminent situation. And our team had to do some very major intervention because this continued and charged, charges had to be brought for making of criminal threats. However, for minors, the system is intended to rehabilitate. It is a system based on rehabilitation. For most of the crimes that, that there is, the records are sealed and the, the minor can move on with their life without anybody really finding out about their past. But we still have to, through this protocol, educate teachers that it must be reported. Like I said, of these 46 or so incidents, only 10 were chargeable as making of a criminal threat or vandalism or some other charge related to um, a path towards a school shooting. However, uh, most were handled through intervention with the schools, bringing increased mental health, uh, helping the child cope with suicide. Like Dr. Barnhorst mentioned, suicide ideation is also a big central warning of school shooters. That is something that happens that, that basically informs um, the path towards a, a harm of others, a school shooting. So, so it's really, um, it, 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 it's important to understand that most of the threats never actually result in a criminal charge, but they do result in some intervention that's gonna prevent future violence. Let me give you an example why um, these um, protocols are so important because Teachers are not experts in threat assessment. We had a situation where um, a school personnel basically read the protocol to mean something different than the way it reads and did not report a report by another student of an intention to do harm. When this wasn't reported, um, to our protocol community, to, through the protocols, what happened is that student who made the threat actually learned that a student had reported him. And he ended up actually taking those threats and targeting that other student. That's when the protocols were then followed, but they should have been followed earlier. I'm happy to report that the compliance with the protocols is, is, is great. It's a large, large percentage of complying with the protocols that are signed. But when it's not followed, it can be disastrous. 
And, and this is when we, we brought down the action to stop it. In San Diego, we initiate many responses. Some involve actually a prosecution. Most involve the intervention, including the gun violence restraining orders, which I'm happy to report that my, my colleague, the city attorney, Mara Elliott, leads the nation in, um, in the gun violence restraining orders. So we sometimes bring in intervention by bringing this to the attention of the city attorney through law enforcement, through schools in order to do a gun violence restraining order. There are um, many other interventions, education to the parent, a family unit counseling, which is also super important bringing more education about safety that, that Dr. Barnhorst talked about regarding guns is important because while in the past we relied on mental health and 5150 and having a criminal record, having domestic violence prevent you from purchasing a gun, those days sadly are gone with the ability to get an unserialized ghost gun a gun that doesn't come from a, a, a place where there is a felony check, there are checks on 5150. The ability to essentially get a Lego kit to make an unserialized ghost gun, which is at the, you know, at the core of why we're seeing some increase in shootings in San Diego County related to ghost guns. Now there are federal laws uh, making their way to help with ghost guns. However, this makes threat assessment and prevention even more critical than ever because of the fact that the traditional ways to prevent someone from getting a gun are really removed with the ability to get an unserialized ghost gun. And therefore, the conversations about prevention and about following a protocol and having a health protocol also in place as to what you need to do when there is a concern, when there is a threat, what is that protocol? Like, the, like what was mentioned, um, the three-step protocol that, um, that Dr. Barnhorns mentioned. We're hoping to expand our protocol, our 42 school district protocol to private schools. We've been asked to expand it recently. Our, um, our new Cardinal um, has McElroy has asked to expand that to private schools. So bringing more protection. But our experience, um, DDA Lopez and I is that it has been the voice of other students and empowering students to report concerning behavior that has been at the heart of the prevention efforts that, uh, that are at the heart of the protocol. Empowering students to speak out and to, to feel empowered that they will be um, left anonymous if that's their wish, that they will be protected so that we can um, save lives together. So it's my pleasure to have had this opportunity to let you know about how we at the DA's office, law enforcement and schools um, and health professionals, mental health professionals have come together to prevent uh, harm to our schools um, through this uh, protocol that is up to date and a first of its kind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, DA Stefan, for sharing that incredible information. We, we really appreciate it. There is a question in the chat from one of our local emergency physicians, Dr. Fisher. He asks, how does someone request gun violence restraining order for a patient? Contact local law enforcement? Is there a form or justification that has to be documented? This is a great, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, this is a great question and one that I, I should have addressed more in my presentation. Um, so in California, healthcare providers are not practitioners or uh, are not petitioners, although 
that in other states they have made them so, and it was something that was really extensively discussed here and ultimately decided against um, for a variety of reasons. But the way for us to, if we if we find somebody that we think like, oh, this person really is, is high risk and they need to not have access to their firearms, um, I've taken one of two paths. I've talked to family members and had them petition. So in one case, I had a woman who lived with her parents, lots of guns in the house. Um, dad was a locksmith and she was like, I can get into whatever safe. And I really wanted to send her home, um, but I wanted to send her to a home with no guns and make sure she couldn't buy a new one. And so I convinced her parents to petition because they were very much involved in her care and safety. Um, and then in another few cases where there's been, you know, an adolescent or young adult making threats of mass shootings, I've called law enforcement. And as, D as DA Stefan said, there is no HIPAA concern there. HIPAA has made it very clear if you think somebody is a serious and imminent threat, um, that you are able to give their PHI to someone who's able to lessen that threat. And then they even go a whole other step and say, and we are not going to second guess the judgment of a healthcare provider who is trying to do their best here. So um, yes, you are able to share that information with law enforcement. Sometimes it can be tricky in the beginning. A lot of law enforcement agents hadn't um, heard of this, this option and they didn't know about it. You know, I work with the FBI up here when they are investigating school shootings. And that was how I got involved it was the first time it happened. They were like, what is this order? And they're, you know, we're very enthusiastic to learn more about it. So, um, and San Diego, as uh, DA Stefan has said, really has led the way on getting, getting a system in place for these kinds of orders. And I think more counties in, in California are following suit. Thank you. Uh, DA Stefan, do you have something to add to that? Uh, well, the, the law expanded recently, like Dr. Barnhorns, it, it used to be um, really law enforcement, but the law expanded now to allow employers also, which is a, a very nice expansion because we do see um, uh, that sometimes the first signs of threats is, is, is employers um, see it, you know, and we, we've seen that situations with uh, people coming back and shooting um, at their employer's business. Um, so that was added um, to family members uh, for after discussion, uh, the medical field was not added, but uh, you do have a path. Um, I can assure you that law enforcement, if a, if a health professional called with a concern, uh, you will, um, you will be, automatically viewed as a credible source and um, an action would be taken to pursue um, to pursue an order. Thank you. And we have another question from uh, Dr. Tudor, who is our deputy chief medical officer for the county. And she asks, is there a way we can collaborate and support these efforts with school nurses? That's a great question. Um, and I, I don't have any specific resources about it now, except to say that um, we recently, one of our webinars was presented by a school nurse who is um, doing some of these threat assessment protocols and some school shooting work from her school system. So if you're interested in watching that webinar, it's on our Bullet Points Project website under more resources. It's a webinar and the nurse's name is Robin Kogan and she's a great resource for this kind of stuff. And with the school protocols, um, it's meant to encompass the entire school. So the, the protocols are supposed to be shared with, with everyone, but it's an excellent point. And definitely uh, DDA Lopez and I will talk about how to make sure that the school nurses um, are specifically um, trained on the protocol and what to do. Excellent, thank you. And Lynn Seabloom asks, can we add the links to the DA's education on this topic, similar to the strangulation ED links? So uh, we will track that down. Dr. Tudor says, thank you. We have some additional connections and relationships with the school nurses due to the pandemic. Another thought I had during the presentation is uh, most of you are aware that the community paramedicine regulations uh, recently passed the EMS commission just last week. And is there something in a community paramedicine project we might be able to do in terms of doing assessment for um, safety of the firearms? You know, we go in, we look at uh, loose rugs so that people don't slip and fall and break a hip, but maybe we could add in something about firearms. I don't know, is anybody doing anything along those lines? That sounds related to the project that we're working on through bullet points for um, 
I didn't know that about the loose rugs, but that's a great analogy. And I'm gonna bring that up with our, uh, our EMS educator who's working on that project. Thank you. And Roxanne mentions in the chat that the Fusion Center and LACC is a good resource, good point. Yes, to, to add to that, that's, that's the way that we've been able to make sure that uh, we don't have somebody just be moved from school to school without, because you can't do a threat assessment without knowing the entire history. You know, a, a joke um, is viewed in a different context if you, you had that uh, intervention earlier, a counseling intervention, and, and the person repeated. Uh, because that's when we start to look at open source intelligence. We look at, we use our catch team to discover if they use an anonymizer, the IP address to, because how can you know what kind of threat somebody is if you don't know who made the threat? So that's a big part of it. We look at previous history. We look at purchases of weapons or searches for weapons or whether that home has a registered weapon, which then heightens the risk immediately and causes our intervention to be different. And that's all done working with the LECC, the Law Enforcement Coordination Center, because we have at least 12 uh, police agencies and multiple sheriff substations. And to keep all that information um, organized, uh, the LECC is an amazing partner. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any hands or anything more in the chat. Wonderful. Well, again, I'd like to extend a, a huge appreciation to both of our speakers. Uh, that was just really amazing and incredible. And we learned a lot from you. I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chats. Thank you, thank you, fabulous, fabulous. I wish I had a recording of the applause. I'll have to get an applause recording next time we do this. And uh, please uh, reach out to us if there's anything uh, we can do to assist. Oh, I see some applause hands. Very good. And thank you, everybody. Stay safe out there. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you for having us. That was great. Thank you so much.